You were not meant to be a slave to the grind. You were not meant to trade your life force for money. You can escape gravity. You can unlock your life. You got this. Let's go. Hello and welcome to Unlock Your Life. This is your host, Jennings Smith. Guys, I've got a real treat of a guest here. Kevin Bupp was kind enough to have me on his podcast, and I wanted to share his message with you guys today because he's kind of focusing on a niche that I definitely don't know much about, and I want to hear more about that. And he's been in the business a long time, $250 million worth of real estate transactions. He owns apartments, single family medical, self-storage. He's even got an office building, which everyone's scared of today, but he's plunging (laughs) in with that. He's an author of a book, The Cashflow Investor. If you hang around, I'm going to tell you at the end how to get a free copy. He's going to send you a free PDF copy. And if you want a a real copy, you can even get that. Just, Just pay $6 for shipping. But Kevin, man, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate you and welcome. Jennings, thanks for having me, man. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. So, dude, let's get right into it. You piqued my interest with parking lots and mobile home parks. Now, I have owned a couple mobile home parks. I sold them because I wasn't great at managing them, (laughs) but I know there's money to be made there. And parking lots, I've never done, you know, but I I like the idea of buying a square of dirt. I guess I do parking lots with some of my self storage stuff. I got parking there, but, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I'd like to kind of focus on those asset classes and tell people, you know, how did they get started? Why did you get into mobile home parks? Like what was the attraction? Because there's so many assets we can pick in real estate and I know you do them all, but that seems to be a focus of yours. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I didn't know too much about mobile home parks when I when I first started investing in, in real estate. So I was 19. I started like a lot of folks do. I started buying single family homes and um, fixing up, you know, rougher homes. And uh, initially it was, you know, to fix them up and keep them as long-term rentals. And then I realized that I was, you know, it would take a long time for me to be able to buy the second one, the third one. So I, I, I kind of evolved my model to you know, buy three homes, you know, wholesale two of the three and then keep one. And then I did that for quite a period of time, built a big portfolio of single family homes back in my, my early to mid twenties and then started buying apartment complexes back then as well. And then, you know, just uh, apartment complexes opened up my eyes to just the bigger game, you know, commercial real estate in general, Mm -hmm. just bigger deals. I realized, you know, the inefficiencies that existed with trying to buy, you know, a hundred single family properties. It's just a lot of energy, a lot of work, a lot of resources, and it's much easier to buy a hundred doors underneath one roof or one property. And I felt the same way about, about commercial real estate. You know, back then my first exposure was to self storage. This was back before self storage was as sexy of an asset class <laughs> as it is today. But then I got introduced to, you know, a litany of others as well. You know, office, retail. Uh, I've owned just about every type of, of real estate. And, you know, fast forward to, you know, 2008, my, my residential portfolio suffered uh, dearly down here in Florida in 2008. And it took a couple of years of damage control and working through just a, a, you know, a fallout of the real estate market down here. I mean, it was just like ground zero. Yeah. And I was looking for a way to rebuild. And it took me a couple of years to really even think about rebuilding. But when I was ready to do that, I, I knew that and I felt that um, multifamily w- was going to be the way and I wasn't considering anything else. But I had a lunch one day with a guy named Randy and Randy owned mobile home parks. He had been a banker for 30 years and then retired. And for his retirement, since he had he had he, I guess he had a number of clients that owned mobile home parks here in Florida and he always got to see their P&Ls and it was like. I need to take my retirement funds. And he went and bought three mobile home parks and that was his retirement. They're really nice ones. And uh, he's like, you need to consider these. Uh, and so after a two hour lunch out with Randy one day, um, I was introduced to him by a friend. Um, I was like, I'm going to go buy a mobile home park. So this is like 2011. And fast forward about a year, I bought a, I looked, I looked, I looked, I found one. I bought a mobile home park in Atlanta, Georgia, which we literally owned up until like a year and a half ago. And then it went well, bought the second one, bought the third one. It was all my capital or, you know, a, a private investor capital, like, you know, just friends, family, stuff like that. And then um, felt that it had a really good niche. And uh, just like, you know, how these things sometimes come together, they perform well. My ROI was way higher than what I anticipated. And back then there wasn't a lot of competition in the space. You know, banks didn't understand the asset class. So it was really hard to get lending. So a lot of owner financing deals got done, you know, back in the day. Today it's very different, but um, we just kind of had a free for all and started buying parks left and right. And um, 
and we're still buying them today. Uh, you know, our business models change slightly. You know, we buy much larger communities today than maybe what we would have bought back then, but we're still pretty much the same. We still look for the same underlying fundamentals when we're looking at a park in the market and uh, it's treated us quite well. Walk me through that Atlanta deal, you know, yeah. like how big was it? How much was it? How'd you find it? And what attracted you to it? Yeah. So again, remember this is back in 2012. So a very different landscape than what we're in today. You know, lots of distressed real estate, like, you know, Atlanta, South Atlanta got hit really hard. Like uh, that's where the, the, a lot of the growth and the push was happening. And so, you know, 2011, 2012, Atlanta still had not recovered from the housing crash. And a lot of, a lot of markets hadn't, you know, they, they, they might've been coming on the upswing, but like they were still foreclosures and REOs and just, you know, half built developments and things like that. So this deal was kind of at the fringe of a lot of the new push where like the new retail strip centers were going in and, and, and new housing developments were going in, but a lot of the starts, you know, never got started or maybe made it partial away. And, um, this deal, long story short, we, it was an REO, it was a bank owned. And, and the story goes that the guy that owned it before us, that lost it to the bank, um, he had bought it about 15 years prior. Um, he was a slumlord. I guess it was a really rough rundown park. It had really crappy homes in it. It was a, all rental homes. And he's just he was just sad. Like he was known in the area as a slumlord. He didn't keep up. Code enforcement was always on him for those roads, for potholes and for trash and all that. And at some point during that stage, one of the hurricanes had hit uh, the Gulf Coast somewhere. I forget which hurricane it was. And when hurricanes hit, FEMA comes in and gets a bunch of, you know, temporary housing, mobile homes, and they go put them in places where they can, where people have been displaced to give them a place to live while they rebuild. And then once they're done with those, they normally auction them off. They have, you know, FEMA gov government auctions. And so this guy went and bought, he went and bought, uh, it's a 34 space park. He went and bought uh, 29 of these lightly used, you know, they're only like two or three years old, FEMA mobile homes. And uh, the local city said, well, in order for us to allow you to replace the homes that are in there, you need to do X, Y, and Z. Like you need to finally improve this park. So he put new roads in, he put new infrastructure and water and sewer lines, and he brought all these homes in, took out a bunch of debt to do that from a local bank, but then continued running it like a slumlord. And so long story short, he over leveraged it based on his business model and he lost it. And, and uh, we ended up picking it up about three years after. It was in horrible shape, had been vandalized, all the AC units stole, stolen. Uh, we paid 200 grand for it. Um, it was a 34 space park, had 29 mobile homes in it. They all came with the sale. We paid 200 grand for it, you know, put another, I think roughly three, probably about 300 K of just rehabbing each one of those respective homes. And then, you know, within a year and a half, did a cash out refinance, got 100% of our money back out of it. I think it appraised at that point in time for like a million bucks. And then, um, you know, it was a phenomenal deal. I mean, like it, 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 you know, net, net, net after debt service and expenses, it cash flowed just at about six figures a year. So $100,000 a year for that small asset. What'd you do with those yeah. homes? Did you sell them off owner finance? Did you yeah. keep them rentals or what'd you do? That's a good question. And so again, it all goes to the market that you're in, right? And so again, remember that this area was still kind of on the fringe. It was, it was like today, it's a different, it's a very different place. Um, today, you would be able to find buyers that had 25, 30K to come in and buy those homes. That would be no issue. Back then, um, we tried to sell them in a perfect world. We would have just sold them off and had lot rent underneath, mm -hmm. but it, it just, the market wouldn't support it. It wasn't that market. And so we did rentals or lease options, uh, Lease options, that that demographic is still a rental. Most of the time they turn over every 12 or 18 months. And so you're dealing with a C-class tenant base, but it was fine. We got good rents. We got really strong rents. I think we were renting them on average for about, at least in the beginning, about 700 bucks a month. I think by the time we sold it, they were probably $900 a month or maybe even slightly higher than that. And, um, you know, there was a, it, it, it ran well. I think we, we sold it at a price for $1.4 million and, um, you know, uh, life was good. So just, we That's saw awesome. that as the, as the case study, right? Like that, that became the, how do we replicate this particular deal? And, and, and what I realized is that I, I like fixing things up and I've fixed up hundreds of homes. I, I've done major rehabs. This was probably still to this day, not the heaviest rehab per se, but it was zero cash flow. There wasn't a person living in it when we took it yeah. over. And so, I mean, it was zero cash flow for eight plus months. And so like, I don't like that model. Um, that model works if you're truly buying at such a low basis where you can't lose. And we kind of did there, but um, fast forward to today, we're a value add player. You know, we, that's what we like to buy, but we like to buy things that are, 
you know, it may not stabilize, but you know, they've got cash flow coming in and yeah. there's some immediate upside potential, but we can at least cover our operating expenses while we're doing the rehab and, and value add piece. So it's funny because the first mobile home park I bought, it was almost carbon copy. I mean, oh. <laughs> it, it was 30, I think it was like 32 units or 36 units. It was half empty. Uh, now we did have the some tenants they're paying, so there was some cash flow. But yeah, we bought it for one hundred eighty thousand cash. We ended up putting another one hundred fifty thousand in, like moving in homes and filling up the rest of the park. Mm -hmm. So it was a mix, like about half tenant owned homes, half rentals. But then yeah, we got an offer for seven fifty eighteen months later, and and we sold it. And I was like, wow, that that worked. And I was only the money guy. Like I brought the down payment for them. And they did all the work and I got 50% yeah. of the equity for raising the money. And uh, I gave 20% to the guy that brought, actually brought the money and he got a nine pref on his money. So I got 30% of the deal for fairly little effort, but yeah, it, did go, it did go really well. Yeah. You know, it's a good business. Again, it's, it's evolved quite a bit. It's very different today than what it was even just, uh, gosh, it's very different day than even what it was like six, seven years ago, even from a lender perspective. You know, back then I remember banging my head against the wall for the first couple of years. I'd find deals, great opportunities ahead, good underlying fundamentals, you know, economically we're stable, we're in good markets and would have to go talk to 10 banks and get turned down by nine of them just because they literally didn't understand the, the business model at all. And it's a very simple business model. It, it literally is not complex at all in nature, but they just, mobile home parks really got a negative stigma and they got placed into this bad bucket. Like they were all bad, no matter even if they made a lot of money on paper, like look at the PNL here, guys. Like what, what are you not seeing? Like, aren't you a, yeah. a bank that's supposed to lend on stabilized businesses that cash flow and that are safe investments? Well, here you go. It's been around for 30 years. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> But a lot of them, like they just didn't get it. There was a fear and that's changed. It's shifted. Now banks are clamoring to put money into mobile home parks. You know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you know, the agency lenders are, they love the space. They're CMBS lenders. There's local, regional, national banks. I mean, they all love it now, but 10 years ago, that definitely was not the case. <laughs> so if I'm a guy out there and I, you know, I've got some rentals, maybe I'm in your position. What would you look for? You know, how would you say this deal might have potential and I'm going to dig deeper into that. And what size would you recommend somebody start with? Yeah, those are great questions. I mean, first and foremost, it's, it's all, you know, everyone heard, you know, heard the saying location, location, location. That's definitely the truth. I mean, I was having a conversation the other day about with a, a good friend of mine. He owns, you know, about 7,000 apartment units, but we're talking about some of the deals that didn't go as planned. And one of those deals was actually, it's in Austin, Texas, which, you know, everyone just thinks, broad blanket approach. Austin, you could buy anywhere in Austin and it's phenomenal, <laughs> but Austin's got bad neighborhoods also. I mean, it does. Oh, Every yeah. area has got bad neighborhoods and they bought this deal and they did, you know, they did the rehab. They were putting in X amount of dollars per unit. And this guy's a good operator. He knows his business well, um, but you don't always hit it out of the park. Some deals just don't go as planned no matter what you do. And after like 18 months, like literally it, it was surrounded by a bad neighborhood. And so where I'm going with the story is like, you can't change the neighborhood unless you buy the entire neighborhood. You can't change the neighborhood and you can't change the market. And so if it's a crappy market, but it's a pretty property, you're not going to change the market. More than likely, you're going to have to pay a lot of extra money to keep that thing pretty. And you're never going to be able to attract the ideal tenants that you want there. And the same thing happened with him. He took this ugly property that was in Austin, a great market, but in not the most desirable neighborhood, tried to make it pretty to change things around. But the outside negative elements kept coming in and stealing things. He had a homeless problem. And, and anyway, he ended up losing money. He literally lost money on a deal in the last five years in Austin, Texas. Like that doesn't even make sense, right? For, to mm -hmm. most people. And so location is important. Uh, just know that you'll never be able to change the market. Don't ever just shop based on cap rate. You know, you see these deals come out on, uh, you know, through different wholesalers or on LoofNet or whatever. And it's got a nine cap or a 10 cap or something like that. But it's in like... I don't know, some podunk area, Alabama, right? No offense to Alabama, but like just it's in the middle of nowhere that has no underlying economic uh, stability. You know, there's not jobs. It's poor. You're not going to fix that. I don't care if you dump a bunch of money into it. So first and foremost, buying buy a good market, good, strong market that has demand for affordable housing. Um, it doesn't have too much excess affordable housing because there's some markets out there that have it's there's not an affordable housing crisis. There's some areas where it's still <laughs> cheap to live. And then as far as size, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer there. I mean, I, I have found that 
that first park I bought is probably about the smallest that we wouldn't even consider that park today just because our, our business needs more scale in order to you know justify buying something. But, you know, if I was just buying it for myself, I look at it as how much top line revenue does this community generate? And can I afford, can that, um, the revenue afford to have someone on payroll that's at the community, someone I can actually pay a reasonable wage to, that's got a brain that can run the day-to-day operations, that knows how to use a computer, that can handle, you know, handing out notices and, you know, handle the day-to-day property management there at the community itself. And that's a big piece of it. If, if you literally you don't have enough money to pay somebody because your community only generates, you know, I don't know, top line, it generates $50,000 a year. And after it's all said and done, your NOI is 25,000. You really don't have that much money left over to pay anybody anything to do anything in that community. And so that's going to be a challenge. That means you're going to be in the trenches. You're literally going to be there. You're going to be the guy and you're not going to be able to afford to pay anyone to actually manage or oversee it. And so Get finding that scale that's necessary to have a top enough top line revenue to be able to afford an on site manager. That's first and foremost of importance. And then some of the other things to consider is you know, depending on what type of utilities it has. Like I see a lot of communities that have septics, they have private water, private sewer. Well, those systems are more expensive to maintain and operate over long term. A lot of people argue that, like, well, septics are cheap. You literally have to get a pump once every five years, but things happen to those septic systems. You know, components have to be replaced. They do have to be pumped, but you have leach fields that go bad. Wells, the same thing. Well, people are like, that's cheap water. It's coming out of the ground. It's free. No, there's like chlorinators and all kinds of equipment that goes in. There's state testing that has to be done and it's very expensive. And so you want to make sure that the, your park's got enough revenue to where if you have a major CapEx expense that's not planned for, like a $5,000 chlorinator going out, that, that, that doesn't wipe out 20% of your take home on that park, right? So again, scale is important. I think 40 to 50 spaces is, is kind of like a safe bet to where you've got enough revenue to deal with some of those nuances without completely knocking out all of your potential profits for an entire year. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely things to watch out for. Yeah. We bought a 12 unit mobile home park and that was a mistake. It was just too small. Um, I mean, we ended up selling it. I think we made a hundred grand, but it was like a huge headache and it was all park owned homes, all rentals. And every time we, I mean, that, that, little deal gave us more heartburn than a lot of our 1500 and 200 unit apartment complexes. Absolutely. So. Well, that's also probably because you guys were literally, you were direct to the source as well. I'm assuming you, I mean, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Did you have a strong onsite manager that kind of managed the day to day? Or were you guys no. the ones that, yeah, yeah we were, right. the, we were the, that's yeah, it. We did a lot. You got to put the layer, you got to put that yeah. layer in in between and but you need to have a good layer and you can't afford to pay a good layer in between for you know one of the 12 space park i got it i got it okay so parking lots tell me a little bit about that yeah i mean it's uh it's got a lot of similarities to mobile home parks i mean you know people are renting space to park their vehicles and so we buy parking lots in you know high demand downtown CBD locations um, where there's limited parking supply or in, in highly visited tourism locations. So for example, you know, I'll give you two examples of parking lots that we just bought recently and kind of what the business plan is of each. And so we just closed one two weeks ago. It's in downtown Phoenix. It's a parking garage. It literally, it's a stone store. When I say stone store, it's, it's the closest parking garage to Maricopa County Courthouse, which is the second largest courthouse in the, in the country. And so you've got all the activity that a courthouse gets. It's massive. And so that parking garage is the primary one for that. It's right up the road from where the Phoenix Suns play, like literally two blocks away from where the Phoenix Suns play. It's another two blocks away from where all the major entertainment, where the major entertainment venue is in downtown, where Elton John and Billy Joe and all those guys play. It's also got a nightlife down there. So it's got all these demand drivers. It's also got some office, which isn't the most desirable, but like the majority of the demand drivers are not related to office at all. They're related to bars, restaurant, residential, uh, entertainment, sports, and courthouse, all of which the majority of those aren't going anywhere anytime soon. Office, whatever, it's having its, it's having its challenges and probably won't ever be back to what it was prior to COVID. But, and so like to us, we looked at that and, and first and foremost, we, we know the owners, uh, they haven't really injected any money back into it for a number of years. Um, it's got old equipment, old gates, you know, old operating system that there's traffic jams trying to get in and out of it. And people know that. And so Sometimes people don't park there because they don't want to get stuck behind 20 cars trying to get out. It's got some deferred maintenance on it, but, you know, it's built fairly stout. And so we basically looked at it and says, 
we know that there's being money left on the table here. The current operator that's that's managing the day to day, they're an antiquated company. They don't leverage dynamic pricing. So like when there's like big events, for example, uh, gosh, there was a big act there. It just happened a couple of weeks ago and all the other parking lots in the area had a flat fee of anywhere from 50 to $60. This parking garage was before we closed on it was at $30. They didn't adjust it accordingly. They don't, they don't have the technology or the software to actually understand what the supply and demand economics are and where their pricing should be given what everyone else is charging for parking. And so it filled up, but it filled up at half the price of what it should have. So we're going in, upgrading the technology, upgrading the operating system, putting a better management company in place there, you're fixing deferred maintenance. And we're looking to drive the, you know, the be able to drive the top line revenues anywhere from, you know, 20 to 25% above what was already a very stable income base with the property. And so just doing just like with these value add apartments that, that, you know, that I know you do just so, taking something and doing a little better than the person before you. So you're seeing something that has an upside and maybe you can pay more. That's how you're getting the deal because you you're seeing something that someone else's. So you're like, maybe, Hey, in place cap rate, I'm paying a pretty low cap rate, but I know I can make more money with it. And what, that's right. What type of cap rates do they go for and what kind of expense ratios do they run? Yeah. That, on that deal, that's, that's an anomaly because it came with uh, some retail. Uh, it was kind of a take or take nothing. So it's, it's predominantly it's garage. It was a $16 million deal. 13 and a half of that deal was really attributed to the garage. And then the office and the retail was Louis, we got it for next to nothing, almost free. And so when you break it down from that perspective, we bought in right around just over a seven cap, which if that garage was being sold as a standalone, which it, it couldn't just given the underlying debt terms and, and things like that, there were some complexities there. But if that garage would have been sold as a standalone and even in today's market where the, where the, where the debt is and all that, it would have been an institution that came in and bought it, given its location. And it probably would have traded for like a high five cap, maybe low six cap, you know, even, hmm. even with the debt where it's at today, it's, they don't transact often. I mean, they're very desirable and they don't transact often. We just happen to be willing to take down kind of the entire pairing of all three of the assets. And so it allowed us to push the the needle a little bit more and actually get a little more aggressive with the seller on pricing. And is your plan to carve off that retail at some point? Can you? Yeah. You yeah. We did the debt. That is it. That is it. But you know, the interesting thing is that, yeah, so we we're putting debt in place right now. We've took it down all cash and, um, and it's being structured so that we've got carve outs on both the retail and the office. But you know, the interesting thing is that the, the retail stable, the retail actually is performing quite well. Um, it's a very desirable location downtown. It's walkable to everything. It's in the heart of all the growth in downtown. In the office, it's an interesting anomaly as well because offices, you know, even in downtown Phoenix, like there's roughly, you know, 30, I think it's like 38% vacancy rate right now. Like it's pretty significant. Mm, but wow. most of the offices in downtown Phoenix are massive. You're talking like they're looking for companies to take up floor spaces of 20 to 40, 50,000 square feet, right? Like they got massive floor. Every floor is 40,000 square feet. This is a different building. It's really narrow. Um, it's really unique location. It's got unique architecture and the floor plates are really, really small. And so when we took it over, it was nearly 70% occupied. It's got lots of startups in there and small technology companies. So it's a perfect size space to where the smaller businesses, they mainly started as a solopreneur at a WeWork, which is there's one right mm -hmm. down the road. And now they've got three or four staff members. Well, it's incredibly expensive to get an office space big enough for four people to WeWork. Like you're probably going to be paying like $4,000 a month for four people, maybe more than that. They can come to our space, get a 1,200, 1,500 square foot, very small office, and ours for probably half the price of what they'd be paying at WeWork. And it's a very funky location. Again, just as walkable to all the nightlife and entertainment and restaurants. And so we actually just, we literally have two LOIs today on some of the rem remaining office space. When, when office is not leasing anywhere else, we literally have two LOIs on our desk right now for some of the remaining office space that's in there. So we, we feel very confident we'll that's be able amazing. to lease that up fairly quickly and probably get it to, you know, 95% occupancy in like the next three months. But only because of the small floor plate size. We're only trying to lease out chunks of like, 1,500 square feet, 3,000 square feet. We don't have to find a user for 20,000 square feet all at once, if that makes sense. Right. And I think that's so, I was just at a conference that was all about retail and commercial, industrial, and those space sizes are so critical, you know, where if you've got that, I mean, in flex, uh, 2,000 square foot with an office is really hot. In office, it's, or not office, but retail, it's like 1,500 to 3,000 square feet. You can find a lot of tenant bases and it's much harder yep. to place like a 30,000 square foot grocery anchor or Best Buy or whatever. And That's if that right. tenant leaves you, you can be in real serious trouble pretty quick. 
I'm not suggesting everyone go out there and find office by any means, because I, I think it's a very troubled sector. And uh, I mean, I, you would, we partnered, uh, we brought in a minority partner on this that literally is probably the best in the office space in Phoenix. And they've been around for like 25 years. And so they're kind of running the show on the office and the retail and they got skin in the game. And so like, I'm not saying we wouldn't have done the deal without them, but we brought in a strategic partner because that is not our expertise. We're parking guys. And uh, we know that's the parking, the parking supports the entirety of the deal by itself for what we paid for it. You know, we got a basis really low in the retail in the office and there's a strategy there. And there's one that is pretty clear you know, of, of what we can execute on. And, but I sure as heck wouldn't be looking at most 99.9% of the other office opportunities in the country right now, unless you're going to convert it to multifamily, which lots of guys are doing, but I think that's really the only play right now with office outside of these other little anomalies that we're talking about. Well, and you mentioned bank owned property, REO, like that first mobile home park you bought. And there's going to be a lot of that. I mean, there's going to be a lot of that in, in office. There's going to be Absolutely. some of that in retail. There's going to be some of that in multifamily. I mean, you, you yeah. look at the prices people have been paying for the last two, three years and they're on floating bridge debt and it just doesn't seem like they're going to be able to refinance or sell at the values that they need to sell at. So I think that there's... Those bank owned properties are where you can pick up stuff for 50 cents on the dollar, sometimes even less if you're in the right place at the right time and you're, you got the vision for turning that thing around. That's right. So now tell me about the fund, because if somebody's listening and they're like, Hey, I, I mean, parking lots seems like a great deal. I like mobile home parks. I'd like to partner with somebody that is in the space, understands all the pitfalls, and is going to probably give me better risk-adjusted returns than doing this on my own. How do you structure your fund and how does that work? Yeah, so our fund's a Reg D 506C. Um, we're currently in our third fund. It's SCI Growth and Income Fund 3. And you know, there's different tiers of PREF depending on what type of investment comes in. It's a $100,000 minimum investment. Uh, it starts at a 6 PREF and goes up to an 8 PREF, again, depending on the capital contribution. It's a 70-30 split, 70% to the LPs and 30% to the GPs. I'm not going to go through all the nuances of, of fees and things like that, but I mean, it's a mix. It's an interesting fund because we historically had always done uh, single asset funds, meaning that only mobile home parks, like our first two funds were hundred percent mobile home parks. They were diversified in nature based on location of, of the assets themselves and, and various sizes of assets. But this particular fund was an anomaly because we basically paired parking, which we came to love and mobile home parks and uh, found that there were a lot of investors that, again, wanted that additional diversity of, of these two different asset classes that were very niche in nature. And so our current fund has roughly about 80, 85 million of, of assets under management. We've, we're working towards closing it out right now. We've got two deals, about $30 million left of uh, assets to close on, and uh, it'll be wrapping up August 31st of this year. But still some room left in there if someone has an interest. There's actually a lot of sweat equity. We're kind of at the tail end of it. So it's an interesting locate, or interesting time. If anyone's looking for a fund, take a look at it. Uh, we've got 20 plus million dollars of sweat equity that we built because we've been able to execute on the business plan on a number of the assets that we bought in the last two and a half years. We opened this fund late 2020. And so the, the number of the assets that we bought in the beginning, they're stable. You know, the business plan's been executed. They're stable. They've got a lot of sweat equity built into them. And we're just wrapping up with a few final investments. And uh, just a, it's a really good low risk time to, to be getting involved. So you're able to partake in some of the deals that you took a risk on. You had a plan, but now That's you right. can, like the plan's done. It worked. It, you know, it's, it's generating right. cash flow. It's generating profits. And you're able to partake in that. Guys, Reg D 506C is accredited investors. So, you know, you, you need to have a net worth requirement there. I think a million dollars and you need to have a income of $200,000 single and $300,000 jointly. And you can qualify to invest in a fund like that. That's what he means by that 506 C. So it's not complicated. It's a form and there's a, you probably have a website to verify accreditation. It's not difficult. So if you feel like you've fallen that bucket, it's a good idea if you think you're close to being accredited, it's, it's a good idea to go ahead and get yourself verified so that you know, hey, 506C investments are now open to me. Because there's a lot That's of really right. good ones out there that are offering better returns a lot of times than, than the stock market, depending on the operator, of course. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now your book, Cashflow Investor, The Cashflow Investor. If people go to Kevin Bupp.com forward slash free book, that's Kevin B-U-P-P dot com forward slash free book. 
-hmm. you're going to give them a copy of this book? That's right. That's right. They can get a physical copy of it. They can actually get a true physical copy. They just pay for shipping. I think it's six dollars, five ninety nine or six ninety nine for ship. But you'll get a, a legitimate physical copy, you know, in the mail. Or there's a PDF version they can download if they'd prefer to just have the PDF. But and what are they going to learn in that book? Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of it's a compilation of my journey, you know, starting from owning a portfolio of single family rental properties to really the pivotal moment of starting to buy commercial assets and the leverage and the scale that commercial larger deals get you. And so a, a big part of it's about that and the lessons I've learned throughout the years. And then the other portion of it, I would say, is related to the different lessons I've learned through my podcast. So I've interviewed some incredible folks over the last nine years I've been doing my show, um, some very impressive commercial developers and investors that have you know done billions and billions of dollars of transactions that ultimately a number of them became my mentors. And just a lot of the lessons that I've been able to integrate into my own business that I've seen success with, I've shared in this book as well. So it's just, uh, it's a culmination of, of my life experiences in the business world, as well as you know the hundreds of others that I've interviewed over the last nine or 10 years. So it's not just a sales pitch to invest with you as an accredited investor. No, I don't even know if there's a call to action in there <laughs> as far as a sales guys, pitch. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're talking real lessons, life lessons, documenting his journey and yeah. what he's learned from mentors. It sounds like a PDF that I'm going to be, I'm going to be downloading. Yeah. There's a bunch of free resources in there that we share. Anyway, definitely not a sales pitch at all. It wasn't intended to be that more. So it was just a, it was a fun project I started about four years ago and, uh, it fell to the wayside for a couple of years and now I wrapped it up last year and uh, it was just a lot of fun just really looking back and, and really taking a deep dive into things I've learned and things I've done. You know, like a lot of us, we don't, at least I know that's one of the challenges I have. We, we do deals and, you know, we do big projects that we put a lot of time, effort and energy into and lots of stress and I fail a lot of times to reward myself or even to think back, and reflect back on like just, you know, the accomplishment we just had. And this book actually really allowed me to reflect on a lot of times throughout my life of when I did you know, big things or overcame big challenges. And so it was kind of fun recapping the last 20 years, which again, I don't give myself the luxury of doing a lot of times, unfortunately. How did you get yourself out of that rut? I mean, you talk about back you got kicked in the teeth. I mean, we, we kind of, anybody in real estate or a realtor or a contractor or a mortgage broker got kicked in the teeth. You know, it looks like there might be some dark clouds on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, currently, how did you pull yourself out of that? And you said after a couple of years, you were, you, you said up, uh, you're ready to do it again. You're ready to try it again. Yeah. Can you talk me about that emotional experience? It was tough. Um, it was really, really tough. Definitely the toughest part of my life. I mean, I'd never gone through a period like that before. Thank God I didn't have kids or, or wife to support at that point. But, you know, my personal residence went into foreclosure. I, I lived there for a period of time while I tried to figure life out. Unfortunately, one of my, you know, my primary bank, like a lot of my banks were, I mean, they were, they were basically taking back the, you know, they're redirecting the, you know, the income from my rental. So I wasn't living on rentals that were in foreclosure. I did have, you know, kind of some savings, you know, kind of pinholed for just the rainy day. But one of my major bank accounts, personal bank accounts got garnished. And so, I mean, I literally got to the point where I literally had like negative balances in my personal accounts. Home was in foreclosure, no exaggeration at all. And, you know, credit score ended up dipping down like the 400s. And it was just a really, really rough time. You know, I just, I kind of, I switched gears a little bit. It was all damage control with the real estate and not getting knocked on doors, getting served every day and just trying, you know, there weren't, back then there wasn't really like dedicated loan mitigation departments or loan workout departments. They had to create those due to the, all the fallout. And so in the first like year of this all, like there was, these banks just weren't willing to work with folks. I mean, if we were able to hold, if we were, if I was able to hold on for maybe two years, then I probably would have been able to do better workouts with banks, but they weren't prepared to do it until they realized how bad it was really going to get. Cause no one knew how deep this hole was going to go. But I, I really just focused my efforts on health and fitness. And one thing I, I could control, I couldn't control what was going on you know, financially, but I felt that if I felt good every day and you know, I just ate really clean and worked out, that I could at least keep a clear mind to be able to work through some of these stressful moments a little better. And during that period, I got into running. I met a girl who became my wife, right with the, literally at the, the bottom of the bottom, which is crazy. She stuck with me. And uh, she was a big runner and she got me into running and I got really deep into health and fitness. And I created a couple companies that they never killed it, but like they basically allowed me to keep a roof over my head and, and pay for electricity and bills and, and, you know, feed myself. And so, but I really, it was, it was a healthy experience for me because it allowed me to actually 
you know, make some money doing something I loved, which became health, fitness and running. It was built around running. We started a clothing company and started like an events company. And, um, and I literally did that to sustain myself for a couple of years while I was working through, again, this behind the scenes mess of, of all the real estate stuff. And, but you know, that fire of real estate was always burning, you know, like it never went away. And, you know, in hindsight, looking back, I wish I would have not pull my head out of the sand, but I wish I would have looked at the other side of the equation. It's kind of hard to get yourself out of the bubble when you're inside of it, right? And like everyone I knew in Florida was like, even guys that had been through a couple of recessions before, like guys that I felt were way smarter than I, like they were crushed. And I'm like, holy shit, the world's literally, literally my little world's ending here in Florida and everyone's feeling the pain. And I couldn't step away from that and realize that like opportunity is here. Like now is the time to, blood's in the street, my blood's in the street, but there's other blood in the street. So let's figure out how to actually turn things around and capitalize on some of these opportunities. And I didn't do that soon enough. We still took advantage of it, you know, um, once we jumped back in, but um, I just basically ignored the burning fire, came about in 11. That's when I started talking about real estate again, bought a mobile home park 2012. And then that was it, man. I literally used a little bit of savings I had, you know, put away. And um, my girlfriend at the time was now my wife invested some capital with me in that, in that first mobile home park deal. I think just more so she was rolling the dice because all she knew was that I pretty much had lost everything. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. uh, and then we did well with that and, uh, and here we are today. So we're able to turn it back around, but it was tough, buddy. It was tough. Health and fitness and just focus and being present really got me through some, some dark times for sure. Yeah. I love it. And I mean, that's so true with being in, it, it is hard to see it when you're in the thick of it. Cause I remember 2008, 9, 10. And looking back, you're like, oh my gosh, that stuff was so cheap. But at the time, it's like, well, are we even at the bottom? Is it going to get That's worse? Right. Like real estate is nuclear waste. Like I don't want to even yeah. touch it with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. Everybody's buying cheap, real estate. If I can buy it that cheap, who's going to buy from me for more? <laughs> right, <laughs> That's right. how I was thinking. It's like, I can buy this house or whatever for literally pennies on a dollar. But if, if, if I'm able to buy it and I can buy a lot of them. There's a lot of this out here. Like then who's going to buy it for me for more? And when's it, how long is it going to take for it to ever come back? Will it ever come back again? Right. And so like the, those, those negative thoughts, but you live and you and learn, think, right? <laughs> you know, I think we're going to see some of that. I mean, with office, right. There's a lot of it out there. Everybody on the news, how horrible office is. It's, it's probably going to get worse, but there'll be guys that they figure out how to repurpose it into yes. smaller spaces or apartments, or they turn it into, you know, luxury, climate controlled storage or whatever they do, you know, there, there's going to be people that see, Hey, I can buy this for 10 cents on the dollar. And who knows, you know, we're all like, Oh, work from home. Maybe that's just the fad. Maybe working in offices is going to come back and companies are going to see that the production value isn't really there. And yeah. who knows how the market's going to shift. And in 10 years, yeah. we're going to look back and be like, man, we could have got all that office space so cheap. <laughs> yeah. So but, if that, uh, right. If that happens, like, so someone, whoever is willing to take that gamble, there, there's definitely going to be people that are taking that gamble. They're going to take the gamble that they can buy things for literally a quarter of replacement cost for like next to nothing. <laughs> And they're going to make the gamble that as long as they can hold on for the next seven or eight years, like they feel like there might be a shift back to in an in-office environment. And if that does happen, number one, out of the gate, they're going to look like, like people be like, you're an idiot. What are you doing? Like it's ever going back. And then in eight years, if they took all that risk, people be like, you were so smart, you know, like you're a yeah, genius, yeah. you know, lucky or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, no, that wasn't luck. I, I risked my life fortune on, on that gamble, you know, and it just happened to turn out. So yep, yep. time will cool. tell. Well, hey, well, Kevin, thanks for joining us. And uh, I appreciate you telling us your stories. And uh, it's, it's super intriguing. Guys, if you're interested in uh, Kevin's story, head over to kevinbupp.com forward slash free book. If you want to look at Kevin's fun, check that out at kevinbupp.com. Thanks, man. I appreciate it a lot. Jennings, thanks for having me, man. It's been a lot of fun. All right, guys. Well, thanks for spending time. It's our most valuable resource. And make sure you spend some time to work on yourself and unlock your life. Peace. This is the podcastfactory.com.